Guys, Dean McCray here, Liberal Democrat candidate for Eden Monero. Uh, Michelago Regional Community Association has contacted me and some other candidates looking for some answers to some questions, and I thought I'd take some time to, to do so. I spent about three years living in Kawula, which is just up the road. Uh, um, everything's just up the road in a 40,000 square kilometre electric. Um, but yeah, I do love the region and um, I'm happy to help and anything I can do to better clarify mine and my party's stance for, for the voter and for the Australian people, more than happy to do. And um, one of the first questions are my thoughts on climate change and, and policies, etc. around climate change. Um, I don't see climate change as the emergency that some others do. I do see that there is some science that says that you know there are changes. Uh, how much of an impact that is caused by human directly or natural um, transition of, of climate and the planet. I mean, we did have an ice age once before, and we've had extreme uh, climates in our planet's history. Uh, now, in saying that, um, Australia's role should really, as far as I'm concerned, um, be a matter of partnering up, piggybacking off the bigger polluting nations. Our emissions are really, in the grand scheme of a, a global concern, uh, minute. And as such, it's sort of it's very important that we don't chop off our nose to spite our proverbial faces. It's very important to understand that yes, uh, it's, it's it's a thing. We like to be uh, environmentally aware, conscious of the things we're doing, but for us to, as a country, to prioritise climate change as an example over getting our manufacturing industries going, creating jobs, um, creating cheap energy, reliable energy, uh, would be very foolhardy. Um, while, while ever China, India, America, Russia, the, the far bigger countries, the far bigger continents, um, are are putting as much pollution and emissions as what they are, there's really very little that any contribution from us will uh, be able to be, be able to solve. It's just important that we we do the best we can in in relative to our our status in global affairs. Um, you know, if those guys all all sort of do X, Y, and Z, well, yeah, we should probably piggyback off them. But no, we shouldn't be. It's just it's a, it would be foolhardy for us to be leading the charge on climate change because we have such a little effect on overall emissions anyway. So, you know, I don't want my grandmother or your grandmother or anybody else in your family to uh, live in the dark or, or freeze in winter or overheat in summer based on the fact that we um, we have such a small imprint footprint anyway. So, you know, I think it's important to, that we keep a fairly clear and calm perspective on the climate change issue. So, you know, I'm all for renewables, I'm all for low emissions, I'm all for, you know, I, I love coal, I love nuclear, I love I love all of them being on the table and in the discussion. And I think that's the important part, is that we're willing to explore everything that's likely to make um, us a more sustainable nation and a more um, productive one. So that's my thoughts on climate change. Regarding question number two, Re, the... Um, Railway from Canberra to Eden, the Port of Eden. I was down in Eden the other day. Sensational little area, love it. Uh, look, as far as all the infrastructure projects go, uh, I think it's one area that the government does have a role um, in planning and strategising this, but it's important that we get our KPIs right. At the moment, what happens with the big parties is these, the, every, just about every government project blows out in cost, it blows out in time, it blows out in... Can, can we put some KPIs in place when spending taxpayer dollars that if you commit X amounts of millions of taxpayer dollars to a project, that we meet that project on time, under budget, and you know, and we, we take some actual accountability and responsibility on how we're spending the taxpayer dollar. Um, in saying that, all these infrastructure projects are great value, they create jobs, they create work, they create better systems for Australians to get from A to B or transport goods and services from A to B. And I think that's hugely important. I just think it's very important that we also attach some serious KPIs to these sort of projects so that governments and bureaucrats aren't, um, you know, funneling Australian taxpayer dollars off to their mates, you know, in the name of here's a big project, but they're pals and that's okay. So, you know, the transparency is hugely important in my eyes. 
Um, and that's, that's how I feel about that. So if we can uh, create more infrastructure, really good infrastructure, same as big road projects, big road projects are great. If it makes travel more uh, simplified, if it makes it more efficient, I'm all for it. But the, uh, the KPIs need to be in place because at the moment there's no accountability. These projects blow out and we just waste taxpayer dollars, blow out some more because it's not their money. So there's no need for them to be responsible or efficient. And I think they're two key areas that um, governments generally lack. So accountability and responsibility when it comes to spending tax dollars, even on valuable infrastructure projects. Let's just get it right the first time you spend enough on research and development guys, or allegedly you spend enough money and time on it, so let's uh, get it right, eh? Uh, Snowy, Snowy 2.0 was uh, probably, in theory, a good idea once upon a time. I think they've missed the boat on it. Uh, we've, we've spent an absolute bucket load of taxpayer money to, in theory, create more jobs. Uh, it's just, it's, it's another example of, let's do it, let's put an idea together. Let's throw, throw mud at the wall and see what sticks. They, they seem to have never any funds, these, these guys in politics, the bureaucrats and the politicians. But they don't ever seem to put a solid plan in and say, this is the plan. These are the, these are the reasons we, we see great value in it. Um, here's how much it's going to cost. And then they go ahead and do it. What they do is they go, we've got this idea. Let's spend you know, a couple of million dollars on researching it. Again, taxpayer dollars. And then let's spend a couple more million dollars and we'll get a bit of a start going, oh, it's not quite working the way we wanted to. It's important for these guys to have KPIs on anything that they spend, whether it be federal government, state government or local councils. They need accountability. Stop wasting our money on ridiculous projects if you're not going to, one, follow through, and two, you're not going to make them the most efficient that they can possibly be. Uh, big government inefficiency is always a disaster. And... Um, Yep, uh, we can do far, far better than Snowy 2.0. Another, another sort of mismanaged. Queries of the Eden Monero. Um, really, what we, what we need to do is create more jobs. More jobs, more jobs, more jobs. And to do that, we need to um, increase all the industries that we have. We need to support them. And when I say support, that doesn't mean financially support. That just means um, a government should only really be providing basic guidelines on how to get the job done. Most businesses are trying to do the right thing, so whether it be the timber industry, uh, manufacturing industries, um, tourism, agribusiness, all these sorts of things, most of the, the businesses involved in these areas aren't looking for a hand a handout. More often than not, they just want to have, have the shackles taken off so that they can um, operate. I mean, federally speaking, there's over 60 taxes directed at agricultural-based businesses, and that's according to the Treasury website. So. Um, you know, why we're punishing our producers for producing is sort of farcical to me. I'd, I'd really like to see the, the shackles taken off. That's our red and green tape needs to sort of go. Um, bare minimums, guys, bare minimums. Uh, for some reason, these governments think that they know, know best and another rule and another, another law, another hoop to jump through, another, another layer of bureaucratic red tape for businesses to navigate. They somehow think they're helping when really all they're doing is creating another layer of, of problems, confusion. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, a, not a positive thing. So I'd really like to see governments take their role. The, the role is basically, here's all the best information that we can find. Uh, you want to be in the timber industry? Here's, here's your role. Here's your responsibilities. Meet these responsibilities and go bananas. Do whatever you've got to do because you'll find these people have the best interests of the land or the project they're working on, at heart, that's, that's how they make their money. So um, the, the vision of all businesses being evil, I, I, I had a great chat with a, a chicken farmer um, in Kabar, or just out of Kabarga who uh, lost a lot of land and things like that. And feel free to check out our discussion there. Um, it's, all about, it's all about lifting those shackles and letting Aussies do what they do best. And that is, that's work and produce and, and create, create great products. And, um, a government's job is not to, not to dictate terms, it's to work with them to get the best possible outcomes for Australians. Uh, to improve the lives of families and, and employment. So um, the employment thing is, look, we need a far simpler workplace um, system. Our, our workplace relations system is one of the most complicated in the world and it doesn't really serve anybody. Businesses are generally stressed to the eyeballs trying to work out how to pay people correctly, let alone 
uh, know what other rules they may or may not be within the thing of, and there's just no, there's no reason for them to be as complicated as they are. Um, the other side of it is we need to drop tax. We need to drop the personal tax-free threshold. If you earn less than $40,000 in Australia, you really should be um, under the tax-free threshold. Why, I'm not sure why the government thinks it's entitled to your money when you're on such a low wicket anyway. And you should be rewarded for being in those entry level, those base level jobs and you're out working as opposed to sitting at home on the dole. So I commend the people in those lower income brackets and I think we should be supporting them by, by removing a lot of those income tax issues. Uh, I also think the tax system does need to be simplified. Um, we currently have over 125 taxes in this country that Australians are subject to in various capacities. I mentioned the, the 60 odd that are directed at the agricultural industry earlier. And we're taxing ourselves to death and you know I'd rather see less handouts to middle class welfare and upper class welfare and we keep the welfare payments very simple and to, you know, in, in the area of the people who actually need it. And all we do with the other people is we let them keep more of what they make, but then they're responsible for their own stuff, uh, which is a scary thought for some I know. Um, but yes, I would love to take away your middle class welfare and your upper class welfare and keep welfare for those who are actually destitute. Uh, government really only has a role of providing support in areas where citizens can't support themselves. That's the only, only purpose for a government. They're not here to, to steal so much of our money and then redisperse it. I think um, one group had, had our combined total taxation. It works out about 56, 57% is gradually of every dollar you spend goes back in, in tax. So uh, whether it be a 10% tax of GST on electricity, why are our electricity bills so high? Well, the government gets a cut. So, they, they're quite happy for your electricity bill to be through the roof. They don't mind one bit, let me tell you. Um, they also, you look at GST on products. So, for example, and I'm a non-smoker, but if you're, if you're a smoker, they're looking at $16 billion worth of revenue this year alone um, on cigarette excise, but then they also chuck you on for GST as well. So they're double dipping at every opportunity. Um, I think that's pretty immoral. Um, and as I said, I'm not a smoker, but for those who are, who choose to, as adults, choose to participate in a legal, a legal habit, um, they shouldn't be violated twice for, for having that, that habit. I think it's, yeah, it's double dipping and it's rude. So look, lowering the cost of living is essential. And when I say lowering the cost of living, we need to get the government out of our pockets. Keep what you earn, far more of what you earn. Maybe, maybe a consumption tax would be, be somewhat tolerable, or I'd, I'd really advocate for a 20% flat tax. All these different tax brackets and rubbish. If, if the numbers are the same for everybody, that, that gives everybody the same incentive to, to work and contribute. And there will be less people who will go, oh, well, why am I paying 50% tax, or why am I paying 20% tax, or 30% tax, or 12% tax? And we all, we all know everybody does whatever tax minimisation they can get away with. I'm okay with that because um, the tax system is sort of set up so that the workers are punished. I don't want anybody punished. I don't think anybody deserves to be punished for being productive. I think we just need a bit, bit more of a level playing field and um, that's how I sort of feel about that. So we need to really work on dropping the cost of living. Don't worry about raising the wages. That's, that's neither here nor there. That's an intangible as, you know, one dollar could buy you a million things. Just have a look at Venezuela over the last few years. They, um, you know, the dollar is just a figure on a on a pad. What counts is what does that dollar buy? What does that dollar do? How far can you take that dollar? And at the moment, with our cost of living as high as it is, our dollar doesn't go very far. So I want to flip the script, and instead of worrying about that side of it, I want to turn around and make that dollar that you earn far more valuable to you and your family. The challenges of an ageing population in Australia is one that isn't, isn't going to have a quick fix. Um, you know, we have people who are sitting in million dollar houses collecting a pension. We have situations whereby people have been taxed their entire working life um, to the eyeballs. So it's very hard to sort of say, we're going to tax you so much and then we're not going to reciprocate with a pension at the end of your working life. You've already contributed so much non-voluntarily. Um, I do support the free enterprise in and around the ageing population. So, you know, private 
healthcare, private homes, um, aged homes, you know, uh, private medical facilities to help help people where possible. But we must always have a safety net for those who can't afford it. And look, the other side of these things is always uh, we shouldn't have been taxing taxing these people so so viciously for the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years of their working life. Uh, we should be helping throughout the, the years to create a more self-reliant, self-sufficient society whereby they don't require government at the end of their working life, or as, as few people as possible require government at the end of their working life. I really, truly believe that if they were left to their own devices, far more, they'd be far more capable of, of managing them than um, a government plan. So, you know, we, we, we need to empower people and we need to allow them to be self-reliant as opposed to what's been happening for the last many, many, many moons and that is trying to create a population that is dependent at the end of their working life on a government handout that may not always exist, certainly not at the rates that our governments like to spend and waste money. So look, that's my, that's my view on, on the ageing population. Um, you know, look after the destitute for sure. If you're sitting in a two or three million dollar home, you may need to consider downsizing to fund your, fund your ongoing retirement. Um, a bit of self-responsibility as opposed to what's the government going to do for me because I know, I know they tell you that they love you but the government and it doesn't matter which party they don't love you they're, they're there for themselves that's why they that's why they exist that's why they're so determined to get elected every year so domestic violence is one of the um, nastiest sort of topics that we have to touch on and that's that's fair enough you know I'm not shy of dealing with those with the tough issues um, look there are multiple types of domestic violence and it's not always just physical uh, one person hits another, etc., etc. Sometimes it's financial, emotional, controlling behaviours, um, and and I don't really endorse any of those sort of sort of attitudes or acts. I think it's really important that as a society we. Uh, I'm a libertarian. I want a freer society. So you know, I really think uh, we need more self-responsibility in these areas. But we also need to create um, the gen the gender war is a debacle, um, and the gender war is is foolhardy. And I think it's been perpetrated a lot by governments and the way they're set up. I would like to see us realise that men need women and women need men and there's no such thing as I don't need a woman, I don't need a man. As, as a community, we, we do need each other and it's important to acknowledge that. Um, a lot of downward pressures on finances cause, cause domestic violence, um, a lot of monetary unemployment, underemployment, not enough work. I'm sure the isolation stuff hasn't hasn't helped. Um, you know, when you force people to be locked in confined spaces for long periods of time, that certainly can't be conducive to healthy relationships because people need to go out and interact with others. And um, well, it's it's a really tough topic, but we do need to ensure that there are enough services available for both men and women who are on the wrong side of this. We need to ensure that there's uh, far more equality in the management of of domestic breakdowns and and you know look we, we need to be nicer to each other in in those sort of arenas you've obviously in some way shape or form loved this person uh, one way or the other it would be nice to see uh, that better managed in, in breakdown and you know the other thing that we really need to ensure is that children children are not weapons children are something that should be um, cherished and you know, it's really sad when we, we see and hear about these horrible, horrible experiences people have. So um, I don't know that more government interference is of any value. I actually would probably be inclined to say less government interference on a, on a direct level, but more, more solid services offered um, for, for these things. So, you know, it's important that government understands its role as to... Upgrades to the Monaro Highway and other major roads in the electorate such as the Brindabella uh, proposed upgrades and, and all the rest of them. Look, they're hugely valuable. It's important that we have the right infrastructure and that's one of the few areas where I do see some government benefit. But again, they've got to meet these KPIs. How long is it going to take to build these roads? What budget are we using? How is it going to benefit you know, the, the population? How is it going to actually help? Are we just building roads for the sake of building roads? Are we upgrading them for the sake of upgrading them? So, in the case of most of these major roads that have come across my desk during this election, I'm in full support of um, them being upgraded, I'm in full support of them uh, being improved, but I'm also in full support of them being improved and upgraded under budget and on time. 
Um, it's important. It's really important that governments just stop wasting your taxpayer money on on projects that blow out by six months or $20 million or $100 million or God only knows what they'll come out with next. Um, so look, for, for all these things, yes, the infrastructure is very important. That's the one area or one of a very small number of areas where I see government has any value whatsoever. And uh, it is important that they get it right. So yeah, look, I'm all for up upgrading the Monaro. I think it's um, important, but I also think it needs to be done efficiently and under budget. So one of the only reasons that I'm willing to tolerate governments exist at all is to provide basic services. So that in includes the causeway because it's obviously a direct link uh, for the people of Mikalago. Um, that's justifiable. Am I happy to support the project? Of course. Uh, I have no doubt that 680 million is probably some sort of poorly, poorly calculated budget by some bureaucrat supporting a friend. Um, I'd really like to see costings managed far better from all of our public officials. Um, I reckon, you know, 10 sensible blokes in Mikalago, as an example, or women, I don't mind, um, <laughs> you know, you know um, but 10, 10 sensible people in the community, or 100 sensible people, you know, whatever, could probably get together and solve this problem um, themselves. And obviously, you shouldn't have to, because our governments are so generally inept that you guys are left with poor basic services. Uh, the lack of lack of sewerage and the lack of um, water, the, the lack of these facilities just shows a complete disregard from the major parties, as usual, um, for anything you actually need. These, these guys want to sell you wants. I only really want to allow the government to sell you needs. Everything outside of needs, the communities can provide themselves. Keep, keep more of your tax dollars. Not be, not be violently stolen from every year, every week in your paycheck, and you know, let the communities manage themselves far better. I think they know what they need, I think they work together far better, as opposed to having some bureaucrat in Canberra or Sydney or wherever they're hiding now, um, telling you what they should and shouldn't do and why they're so special for you and why you need them. I don't really believe you need them beyond basic, very basic infrastructure. So quite happy to support um, getting stuck into them for getting you some basic infrastructure. I think that's a, a minimum justification for their existence, and I'm all for it. As for everything else, I'd like to see them get out of your way and let the people of Michalago run Michalago, manage Michalago, and look after Michalago as they see it a bit more fit. Um, as for the Brumby, the Brumby topic, um, I, I was a bit surprised, admittedly, because it was I always thought it was a state issue, not a federal federal issue. But um, look, I've had a quite a long history in and around horses. Um, my father became a quadriplegic coming off a horse and he was a, an avid bushman and an avid supporter of the Brumbies. Um, and I've, I've sort of had a love-hate relationship with them. Uh, but after the bushfires, I don't know that we have any accurate numbers and accurate counts on how many of these things are still roaming in the mountains, although I did during my travels last week come across a herd and to be fair, they were pretty spectacular to watch. Um, there was probably 20 odd of them, and it was quite amazing watching them. I think historically they have huge significance to Australia, and it would be foolhardy for us to just go and cull the whole lot. I think that's, um, you know, jumping the gun, and I think that falls under the poor management and um, wasting of taxpayer dollars. I think the locals up there know how to deal with them or will choose how to deal with them, the ones that they need to if they get out of hand. And, you know, yes. They are a feral animal, but so are deer, so are, so are pigs, so are foxes, so are numerous things. Um, you know, and, and management is important, of course, but I don't think going in for 100% cull is, is the way to go. I think uh, we, we do need some of those brumbies up there because they're a great part of our history. And from that perspective, they show they have, have value. And I also think that obviously from a, you know, if they do get out of hand numbers wise, let the science speak on how many is probably sustainable up there that, you know, if, if we end up with 30, 40, 50,000 other things, well, maybe then we need to take a serious, serious look at a cull. Um, but from, from what I understand, the numbers aren't that high and they're, they are truly an amazing, beautiful animal to watch. I've, I've never seen anything quite as, quite as interesting as watching them built across the, the Kosciuszko the other day. It was unbelievable. So, um, yeah, my, my take is 
let the locals deal with the Brumbies. Go governments really have no capabilities anyway. Um, most of them, most of the people in Parliament would never have fired a weapon, let alone from a helicopter that they're, they're trying to do. I think that's, they've watched a few too many movies, but who would be surprised? So look guys, yeah, I'd really like to see um, the Brumbies, or I still have a, a Brumby presence up in there. I think it's a, a beautiful thing for Australia. I also, you know, I think it's important for the voters of Michelago and the Ed Monero to understand that, you know, I, I'm not running in this election to, to give you lollies or hand out, hand out freebies. I'm in here to hold governments to account. I'm here to challenge the status quo at every opportunity. And, you know, if you're sick of having um, three layers of government inject itself into your life regularly, uh, I'm probably the candidate for you. If you've ever questioned why um, anything you do in your own property is regulated by a government official, if you've ever questioned why some lunatic in Canberra apparently knows how to manage your life better than you do, I'm probably the candidate for you. So think outside the box um, and have a look at, into the Liberal Democrats because I believe our print, we are the party of principle. We're, we're, we're almost, almost famous in political circles for being the one party that can't be bought. Our principles are our principles and we'd never waver from them. So, uh, yeah, if you're looking for something a little bit different and you're brave enough to, to try something different, uh, Dean McRae for the Liberal Democrats could well be the option for you. So thanks, guys. Have a great day.